everyone. Uh, it's pleasure, my pleasure to talk to you about uh, two of my passions. Uh, and one is grazing cattle and the other is uh, the kind of cattle it takes to graze uh, good grass. So um, I'll get into how our farm is designed and set up and uh, where we've been and then uh, we'll talk about the genetic side of it uh, after that. So several of our, uh, our, our farm facts. Um, our farm was established in 1889 uh, we were a conventional Holstein dairy until 1994. Um, combined the cows, except when the weather was nice and they had a, a dirt lot they could get out on, but basically they were inside. And we were um, cutting all their feed, planting annuals, cutting all their feed, bringing it in to feed them and hauling the manure out. Um, in 1995, uh, we made the decision to switch to a rotational grazing um, on the farm and planted the entire farm in a, a pasture mix. Um, that it's still there today. We haven't reseeded uh, anything but a couple acres since 1995. So uh, it's been a joy to see it continue to develop and uh, get better. Uh, we switched to spring seasonal in 1997. Uh, we had heard a lot about, uh, obviously at, in that early stages, there was not a lot of information in America about grazing. So we uh, leaned heavily on New Zealand and their information. And they were mostly seasonal at that time and we um, thought that was the right way to go and we still believe that we are still spring seasonal and um, but we started that in 1997 we uh, sold our uh, all of our fall caving Holsteins um, in the fall of 1997 and then bought jerseys at that time to cave in the spring and the jerseys have stuck around and the Holsteins have left just because the Holsteins uh, don't have or didn't have the uh, genetics to breed back in 12 months um, we realized in 2000 that we were not using herbicides, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers on the land and we started thinking about organics because that's kind of what, uh, what we were being led into. And, um, but there was no organic market for milk in Maryland uh, in 2000. So we made the decision to stay, to farm the land organically at that time but um, we were still feeding conventional grain uh, to the cows. Uh, then in, in 2005, Organic Valley and Horizon moved into Maryland and um, we went with Organic Valley, thankfully, and are, have been blessed by that uh, decision quite a bit. But uh, July 1st, 2005 was when we were certified organic and uh, we got on the organic uh, truck July 1st. Um, and then in 2006, we started experimenting with raising calves on nurse cows. Um, 2007, we stopped feeding grain in the fall when organic grain prices really spiked. And um, we had been ratcheting down the amount of grain we were feeding the cows all along in preparation for this because at that time, New Zealand was not feeding uh, grain to their cows. And we knew that if they could do it, we should be able to do it as well. So um, a lot of other things came into play there. The cow is not created to eat grain. And uh, um, so we had a commitment to be in no grain anyway for that reason. Um, so currently uh, we farm 310 acres, uh, about uh, uh, 150 are rented and the rest is owned. Uh, we've got 40 in transition right now as well that uh, a landowner contacted us and asked if we wanted to convert his, um, he had bought some land and wanted to convert it from corn. Uh, it was, it had been corn for the last 15, 20 years straight. And so uh, we are in the process of transitioning that uh, to organic. We planted our um, pasture mix of spring in there and um, it'll be July of 21 when it uh, is uh, become certified organic. So that'll be good. Um, we are now calving about 140 cows in the spring. Uh, 35 of those are being nurse cows and the rest are milking. Uh, we raise all of our own replacements. We haven't bought a cow in since 97 or 98 was when we lost, bought, bought our last jerseys in and uh, since that time we've been closed. We do raise bulls for breeding. We use mostly our own bulls uh, now because we're, we're, uh, there aren't many, there aren't many Jersey bulls in America that meet my standards, honestly. Um, we do manage holistically. We use, adap use a, adaptive grazing principles on the farm. So we're, uh, continuing to flex and move and, and adjust as the uh, climate dic dictates and as uh, grazing dictates and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
Our per cow production right now is 6,000 pounds of milk, uh, 5.2 butter fat, 3.8 protein. This year, the butter fat's a lot higher already uh, in the season. Our lowest was about 4.6, and that was just one test for the month of April. We've averaged a 4.9 butter fat. So uh, that's a blessing, especially when you're not getting a ton of milk out of the cows. But um, I think they can do a little better. Uh, it's just um, management is what's holding us back right now. And um, my son Adam and I are the labor force. I'm the fifth generation on the farm, and Adam's the sixth generation. And um, so we do all the work here, and it uh, keeps us stepping. But um, that's where we are right now. One of the things have, that we've really learned about adapt, through adaptive grazing, and I apologize for the next uh, two slides not being real clear. This was as best I could do, but um, it's just not taking too much of the grass off. Um, we if you leave leaf surface, basically what this shows you in equal time, if you, if you really graze your grass down, it's gonna grow a lot slower than if you leave some leaf surface there and uh, it will bounce back a whole lot faster. Um, and that's what, obviously we're here to grow grass and to uh, get as much forage production as we can. And uh, we found that we don't wanna take too much because that not only hurts forage production, but hurts the soil. and um, everything under the soil, which this slide kind of shows you that um, this is some work from uh, Savory Institute, but um, I don't know if it's Dr. Christine Jones uh, from down in Australia that uh, released this or what, but um, when you take 50% of the plant off, and that's, it's hard to gauge, it takes a lot of time to gauge, but when you take 50% of the plant off, the roots don't stop growing. That's a vital key issue. Um, when you take 70% of the plant, even though you're leaving some green leaf, 50% of the roots stop growing for 17 days before you get enough solar collection again to get those roots started. And then when 90% use, which is what we often see in conventional grazing, when it's just the cows are out there all the time, the good plants are 90% use, 100% of the roots stop growing for 17 days. Now that, we can do that, if we want to, if we've got fescue in the spring and we really want to knock the fescue back to get some diversity in, it might be with non-milking cows, good to take it down to 90% so that you can get some diversity in, some clovers coming up through that uh, fescue, uh, which, which helps. So that's part of being adaptive. We don't do the 50% all the time, but we can adjust uh, according to the desired results of that paddock. But Dr. Christine Jones is also very a uh, pioneer in what she calls the liquid carbon uh, cycle. And uh, what she has found is that as long as those roots keep growing and you've got solar um, photosynthesis continuing, that it is a liquid carbon pathway is what she calls it. I'm sorry, the liquid carbon pathway. Um, that plant is continuing to pump carbon into the soil. And when, of course, when you get carbon in the soil, it, it enlivens your soil bacteria and your fungal um, side of it as well. It really releases nutrients that are non-releasable by uh, typical soil tests and um, just continues the cycle of uh, carbon and, and sunshine and, and sequestering carbon and all that sort of good stuff. So there's a tremendous benefit to having those root there, roots there. We've had this idea, um, and it's been taught to us since we were kids and probably previous generations as well, that it's good to slough off some of those roots by grazing hard, because when you graze, you knock the roots off, and then that has organic matter because new roots, roots grow down. Um, that's not necessarily, I mean, there's some truth to it, but it's not as good for building organic matter and soil carbon as keeping that liquid carbon pathway open through live active growing roots at all times. So um, yeah, that was just something that blew my mind when I uh, heard of it several years ago. And uh, it does it does work. I mean, not only the 50% use is keeping the carbon pumping into the soil and you know all the good stuff that's going on in the soil, but it's covering the soil and it's leaving a solar panel so that you can capture more sunshine and the grass root grows faster. So the whole process speeds up. It's like pushing that snowball down a hill. You know, it just keeps going faster and faster and faster and gets better and better. Okay, now to uh, the good grass-fed cow. And 
obviously, if there are any questions, we'll discuss that at the end, but write them down and uh, I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions. Um, and I just also want you to know we have dabbled in beef cows, uh, had a separate beef herd for a little while, but we are now all dairy. And um, what makes a good grass fed cow is the same, the general principles are the same for beef and dairy, but the cow is a little bit different. Um, the cow's got more dairy character, obviously, in the dairy. And, um, but the, a lot of the ratios and what you're looking for is the same. It's just you got to think about a beef cow and a, uh, or a dairy cow. So what we want first off is a large capacious belly on these cows. We want rumen because the rumen has to be large enough to take in high amounts of forage so that she can process that forage into meat or milk um, and or sheep, you know, wool and all that sort of stuff too. So, so the rumen capacity, in my opinion, is the top priority in a good grass-fed cow. She does have to have strength. Um, she's got to be able to carry herself and walk. Uh, sometimes, uh, oftentimes our cows are walking a mile to and from pasture twice a day when they're at the lower end of the farm. So uh, she's got to be able to have the strength to carry herself and to replace that body fat easily in the fall when um, she's building up for winter time. And that strength helps carry them through the winters without losing uh, near as much body fat uh, either. Because we don't want to lose body fat over the winter especially being a spring calving herd. You got a width in the front end, uh, you got to have room for the heart and the lungs, but also width in the rear end uh, for the udder to fit as well. So you're not squeezing that udder and pinching that udder when she walks. Uh, Grass-fed cows have to be intelligent. Um, I know that uh, that will bring a chuckle to some people, but um, they do have to know, you know, what to do and uh, respect fences. Uh, sometimes they're too, so intelligent that they don't, uh, or they can figure out when the fence is off and go through it, but uh, we don't want them that smart, but we want them uh, good and intelligent so that they, they can um, eat the plant that she's supposed to eat at the time for what she needs, that inherent um, ability to choose and know what she needs. And obviously you need a good, good set of feet and legs, but I have seen cows with pretty poor feet and legs get out on pasture and do very well for a lot of years because they're out in their natural environment. They are not um, on concrete all the time. And that makes a huge difference on feet and legs. And again, with feet, along with feet and legs and the rest of all this means she's gotta be an athletic cow. We don't have couch potatoes. Um, Cows in confinement are pretty much couch potatoes. They lay down, they walk over to the feed bunk, walk in to get milk, walk out to the feed bunk and go in and lay down. And um, those cows have problems. Our cows don't have health problems. Um, we don't have any problems with uh, uh, cows cleaning in the spring because they're athletes and they've got, you know, the mineral balance and, and just the, um, just being in shape uh, really keeps them healthy and uh, I mean, we haven't had a cow not clean for, I don't know, probably four or five years. We had a cow had twins a little bit ago and uh, she didn't clean real well, but she cleared up fine. We didn't have to treat her or anything and right back. So um, that's, that's all part of that. Athlete, athletes can uh, bounce back a little quicker than somebody sitting on a couch. And we want a ratio of 60% body and 40% leg. Um, and you'll see pictures of that. Uh, for us, uh, on our cows and what we're aiming for. But that also goes for beef cows too. Um, the, the right kind of cow with that 60% body, well, uh, let's just say the longer the leg gets, the higher the body maintenance is. And body maintenance is something that is, um, it, it's very difficult to carry a, a 2,000 pound Holstein on pasture alone as compared to a 800 pound Jersey on pasture alone. But if you've got a 1200 pound Holstein with 60% body and 40% leg, she's gonna be a lot more efficient in, um, in, in her pasture and turning that pasture into milk. Um, same thing for beef. Uh, if, you're, if you've got these 50-50 cows, which we see in dairy all the time, and in beef uh, you see some, not, not as many, but there's 50-50 cows, they're always thinner, they never um, can carry the body condition. They can never um, breed back as easily. And uh, so, you know, this is just the, the typical phenotype we're looking for. And I say not black in there. I don't mean to offend anybody, but uh, 
we do have, um, I'm a fan of jerseys, obviously, but I used to have Holsteins and uh, I don't care what breed it is or um, combination of breeds it is, but a black cow usually is stressed more in hot weather uh, than uh, lighter color, red, red body cows or brown. Um, I know that's not 100, true 100 percent of the time, but probably 90 percent of the time it is, 95 percent. So uh, unless you're dealing with a true heat tolerant breed, um, and that's, you know, they may not work as well in the wintertime. So we've got to deal with both winter and summer here, and uh, that makes a huge difference. Um, we, I, I believe that epigenetics plays a tremendous role in uh, the right kind of cow that, as well. And so if you want to be a no grain dairy or you know, raise your beef cattle without any grain and finish them without any grain, that calf needs to be started um, without grain and continue its entire life without being fed grain. And when I say grain, I also mean corn silage because corn silage is 50% grain. And so um, it just makes a huge difference you know, if your goal is to go grass-fed and you don't know quite how to start, I would start with my calves and as those girls calve and then the next generation or even as those girls calve, um, you're going to be much further along than if you stop feeding your cows gra grain and continue to feed your calves grain. You're going to be continuing to have to start over almost every year with these animals. So uh, just definitely, um, you know, calves, uh, we keep our nurse, calves on nurse cows for uh, six months. And um, I mean, these calves are tremendous calves uh, when they are weaned and they, they wean easily, obviously at that time, but they, they also um, just come into the milk and string really ready to go. And uh, so that's been a real uh, uh, eye-opening experience. And I say a good bull because 50% of your herd's genetic ability is a result of the sire. We have, uh, I know pre-grazing, yeah, I liked a good bull, but I was so into cows that, uh, you know, I wanted a heifer out of every cow, and uh, that was before sex semen. And I've come to realize that if I've got a tremendous cow, I'd much rather have a bull out of her, because if I use that bull on my cows, that his mother is going to have a greater influence in my herd than any single cow raising her, or a calf out of, a heifer calf out of her. So um, um, we just have, uh, yeah, a good bull is, is of vital importance in, in grazing and grass fed. And we don't have that in um, modern AI genetics. Genomics is just ridiculous, um, especially for grazing ability. So, um, you know, steer away from anything genomic, uh, anything from typical conventional um, AI, um, just won't do it. I don't care if they've got grazing sire in their catalog, those cows, those bulls themselves, the cows, the generations before have not been raised on grass. They're just looking at things that they think would work well in grass. But, um, you know, if, she, if that cow's in confinement, she's not a grass cow. Um, which goes to the next step. I only use bulls from 100% grass-fed lineage. Um, you will be disappointed with the resulting offspring of sires uh, from dams that have been propped up with grain. Uh, we started using New Zealand genetics uh, when we got jerseys in the late 1990s. We liked those cows. They had much more capacity uh, in the rumen capacity, but it was making our jerseys very small and very tight in the front end. So then we, and we also started hearing about um, polled genetics then, and there were no polled bulls in New Zealand, uh, but the New Zealand studs were selling up here. So we um, went with a group of Jersey breeders in uh, Northern Ohio called the North Coast Group, uh, who is no longer really a group anymore. But uh, we started using polled bulls out of their um, genetics, and um, they were totally outside the mainstream. They had no, um, they really wanted nothing to do with conventional AI. So they were breeding the right kind of cows. And uh, so we used them to get the polled heads in. And then we um, found out about the Belladine Duke's Landy bull from uh, that Doug Martin brought in from New Zealand. And uh, he's kind of the uh, capstone, if you will, of, uh, of American grass-fed jerseys. 
or grass-fed jerseys in America, not American jerseys. But, um, and so we, we started using him. Uh, we've uh, line bred to him then. So a lot of our genet or all of our cows have some of his genetics in, but a lot of them have two to three crosses of Landy in now. And um, our polled, uh, we've got uh, really, um, it's a thrill not to have to dehorn calves. And so uh, we, we only use polled bulls, except for that one or two breedings of like Landy, bringing Landy in or uh, some others from his family. So um, prepotent sires, uh, prepotent sires are a key. Uh, and how do you get prepotency? Through line breeding. Um, they, they, what does prepotent mean? It means that the calves are, resemble each other. They, they just look alike. And that's what we really want in our sires because we want that sire to stamp his offspring like he is. So when it, it we just, that's the whole purpose of line breeding is to get sires that stamp themselves uh, the same right kind of genetics in their offspring. And an old term, like begets like. Um, that's something that you don't hear in genetics anymore, but if you want a good grazing cow, you've got to have the, the, a mental picture of the cow and the bull that you like or you're breeding for, and um, you line breed to get that kind of cow and, and sire, but um, you're not gonna be able to take a, uh, a cow that's getting pretty close to what you like to see and just use a bull that's got some numbers on her because it, without even looking at him because you will be disappointed. Uh, it's, it's just a shot in the dark. And um, that is uh, one of the biggest things I see in guys in this area. They, they kind of know what they like in a cow, but the, the sires, they don't even know what the bull looks like. And uh, they are just, you know, there are some good calves out of them or good cows uh, result from it, but a lot of bad ones too. This is just a shot of our um, bull calves on nurse cows. You can see it's breeding season, so that's the big one in the back. But uh, these are, you know, a generation of our bulls. They are uh, probably five to six months old at this time. And uh, well fleshed, really developing into uh, good, good bulls. This is a shot of our cal heifer calves on nurse cows. The nurse cows are grazing, and the heifer calves are kind of there in front, uh, just looking around. These are probably uh, three to four months old at this time at best, but well fleshed, very, very healthy. We don't have sick calves. We haven't had a sick calf in 15 years. I mean, it just, uh, when the, when you graft them onto the nurse cow, they, uh, there's just no health problems at all. And, um, and you can see, um, they're grazing taller stuff. We're not grazing grass short where we want it up there 12 to 18 inches when we get started. Okay, just a real quick, I already talked about a lot of this, but uh, uh, in 95, we were purebred Holstein. Uh, in 1996 was when we started using the New Zealand jerseys, or New Zealand sires. 97, we added jerseys. 98, we had some crossbred jerseys, uh, or we crossbred the jerseys to a few Holsteins. Um, kind of not real excited about the results. 2002, we began breeding for polled heads uh, we, through the North Coast group. And then uh, we also started using some of our own bulls on heifers at that time. Uh, 2006, started learning about line breeding. Um, 2007, our first bull that we collected was uh, Holdrone Lieutenant. He was polled and uh, turned out to be a fantastic bull. 2008, uh, we began focusing on A2A2. Thankfully, Lieutenant was A2A2. And then in eight, 2018, we developed our first bull book, uh, began advertising. We have six bulls now, uh, grazing genetics, uh, all related to Landy and line bread and all that sort of stuff. So uh, that's just a, a look at where we've been. This is the genetic effect of crossbreeding. If our goal is to hit that bullseye, crossbreeding, you will get a few real close there. And, and that's what uh, tickles me about guys that have these herds, they call them rainbow herds because they've got genetics from six, seven different breeds in and they just, they just like the color, the diversity, all that kind of stuff. And they get a couple of cows that are good and they're just thrilled, you know, crossbreeding really works, but then you look at the herd in general and you've got cows from one end to the other on the scale of uh, looks, of quality, of production, of, you know, you, you name it. There's just, it's just, everything's random. Uh, you get some good ones, but you get a lot of bad ones. When you stick within a breed, typically you're gonna get closer to that bullseye. 
but you still have a fair bit of random genetics there that are going to take you outside of your ideal and you'll you have some disappointments and um, that's just I mean, it's happened to us. I, I've been there, believe me. And so that's how I feel I can speak on this because I've been there. And um, you get closer to what you want, but you don't really get head on every time uh, what you want. And we're still you know, getting closer to that. And then if you're line breeding, this is the genetic effect over generations. You're going to close that circle. So you're hitting the bullseye almost all the time. And um, we're not there yet, like I said, but we're getting, uh, we're get, getting closer to that. Um, all the time and and that's a thrill to have and that's part of her potency but to have every calf coming out looking like the next calf and the next calf and even if the color is off but just the makeup of the calf the way she's built the way he's built and um it, it's just a uh, a real joy as a breeder to you know be able to see um, uh, the effects of the line breeding but see calves uh, a bull stamp his daughters, you know, you, you can tell they're out of, out of him. This is, again, a foggy picture, but uh, this is the Landy Bull that came from New Zealand. Just what, um, you know, I can't fault him on much. Um, he wasn't the milkiest bull in the world, but he did really raise butterfat. And, um, but that's, that's kind of what, yeah, uh, a pretty good, pretty darn good bull. This is one of his daughters, probably our best looking daughter. Um, we lost her when she was eight years old, I guess. Uh, she got milk fever overnight one night and rolled down the hill and blew it up and died. And uh, unfortunately, when you have hills, <laughs> that happens uh, on occasion. But um, but she's built well. She got a nice uh, capacity rumen, beautiful udder, um, you know, great feet and legs. She has strength. You know, it looks like she's got a closed uh, uh, front end there just from the way she's standing, but she doesn't. She uh, She really had a nice rear end. But this is one of our nicer Landy daughters. This is our Lieutenant Bull. Uh, we collected him and used him heavily and sold some semen on him. And then we sold him to uh, Ben Gotchel out in uh, Nebraska. And uh, Ben developed him even further. And uh, so we're, we're now line breeding the uh, Lieutenant. Lieutenant was 25% uh, Landy. His dam was a Landy daughter. But then as we're crossing him back on Landy's or Landy's back on his daughters, uh, we're really seeing some nice cows come out of that uh, breeding. Just a couple of lieutenant daughters here. Um, just the, the one in front, especially that room and capacity is tremendous, but just built right. Um, we actually sold her uh, this fall at 10 years old uh, to another farmer who's calving her again this year. She got bred outside of our calving window, so, uh, and he needed some cows, so we sold him a, a group of cows that were all at the end, uh, right outside of our calving window. Um, hated to see her go, just a tremendous cow, tremendous milk cow. Um, she oftentimes was in the 9,000 pound range, even though we were averaging uh, 6,000 and um, she's a well over 5% butterfat cow as well. There's a better shot of her, uh, a little close up, it's a year later and she still got her winter coat on there because that was early spring, but uh, just a deep open chest, um, huge capacity. A uh, decent udder, a good udder. I mean, nice teeth length, um, good feet and legs, thorough position's good. Wide muzzle, we want a real wide muzzle. I probably should have put that on there, but uh, wide muzzle and, and huge nostrils so she can uh, breathe uh, a lot and eat a lot and uh, just no restricted airflow there. Another uh, Landy daughter there uh, under the bush or right in front of the bush. Uh, she's now 11 years old uh, and she's with us. Um, the bull there is Blackjack. He's the uh, second bull that we collected and such and has done a good job for us as his daughters mature. But again, look at the pasture. Uh, this is fall. This is probably September and um, a lot of grass there. And that's what we want because it takes grass to grow grass. <clears throat> this is a lieutenant daughter that um, a tremendous milker. Um, she did, has done beautifully for us and we have uh, I have a bull out of her. She's a lieutenant. We bred her back to Landy and uh, we got him. This is Lander. Uh, he's, um, that's him as a calf. There he is now. But um, as he ages, he's bodying down even more. That was uh, when he was two years old. He's now three. So uh, he's getting close to that 60-40. Good strong front end. 
excellent thorough position and uh, we're really excited about his calves that are on the ground now. This is a uh, uh, full sister to Lander and, uh, and uh, she's, so she's a Landy daughter out of the Lieutenant Dam. So she's carrying, um, what would that be? 62 and a half percent Landy in her. And um, she's just a tremendous cow, tremendous milk cow. This is Lancelot. He's another bull that is a Landy son out of a Lieutenant. Um, fancy bull. I was a little, um, skeptical of him uh, early on just because we have two calves, two heifers out of him the first year. Uh, the rest of them, we used him real lightly the first year and got two heifers and I wasn't overly impressed with them. Now is they're calving again, they're looking better, but um, he's just stamping his pattern. And these are three of his daughters uh, right here and, and they all just are very similar. And we've, we've probably got 12, yeah, in the ballpark of 12 of his daughters uh, this year as two-year-olds. And um, very, very nice cows, love to milk. They, uh, they just really are good milkers, good body capacity, deep chest, wide open, um, beautiful cows. But this, again, is, is what we are striving for, is the uh, deep chest, the huge rumen. And um, to have a chest and rumen like these girls do as two years old, um, we can only guess at what it might be as they age because it just keeps getting the room and just keeps getting larger and, and belt bodies down a little bit more and um, yeah just just a lot to be excited out about about these guys uh, this is blackjack again he's a double landy his uh, um, sire well landy's a grandsire on both his dam and his sire side and uh, he's just a nice bull nice bull um, his daughters are really maturing beautifully and really a lot of strength uh, with um, great cows. This is one as a younger cow and uh, she's improved this year after she calved even and uh, just keeps getting better. And this is just another good grass fed cow. She's actually uh, one of the last ones that doesn't have hardly any landy blood in, but uh, still the kind of cow we love to see, good thorough position, Good, nice udder, feet and legs, nice barrel, um, just a super cow. Uh, good front end on this cow. She's got Landy blood in her as well, obviously. And um, this is another one. Uh, picture's not quite as good because uh, she was halfway across the field, but she's another one that was sold at, this year at 10 years old because uh, she's just a little bit outside the window to that guy. And uh, he's gonna have fun when they start calving, but because uh, just another great cow can just eat a tremendous amount of feed and. Uh, Beautiful, uh, milk beautifully. Um, another uh, lieutenant granddaughter actually, and uh, just a huge uh, capacious belly on her, uh, good front end and um, just all around great cow. So uh, something Nathan Weaver from up in New York um, said a couple years ago, he was down here and spoke and uh, uh, he said, keep good grass in front of the cow and a good bull behind her. And I think that was, uh, that's very wise. Um, uh, a very wise statement because uh, the cow's only 50% of it and the bull's 50%. And, um, but if you can keep good grass, grass in front of the cow and keep breeding them to good grass-fed genetics, you're going to, uh, you're going to succeed. And, uh, but you got to have that ideal cow in your head, an ideal bull in your head, and uh, you know, know what you're getting. Okay, so uh, here's my contact information. If you want to talk to me about it or uh, email me, I can send you a bull catalog. If you know, if you, yeah, I'm not. If you want it, you're, that's fine. If you just want to see, you know, a little bit about the farm story and the bulls, and just see the kind of genetics we have, that's great too. It's whatever you want, but uh, I can send you a um, electronic copy if you email me, and. Um, but that's, uh, feel free to call and I'm uh, more than happy to answer any questions now that you might have. Thank you.